and we are here today to talk about um, what charities can learn from startups. And it'd be good to just get a sense in the room of how many people would say that they're here from a traditional charity, whatever we mean by traditional charity, or even just a charity, registered charity. Great, most of the room. Who is not here from a charity background? Agencies or something else? Something else. Hey, excellent. Okay, um, so it's just interesting to see the makeup of the room, probably what I would have expected, most people from charity world, um, but absolutely want to hear lots of different voices and what we talk about today. Don't stay silent, add your questions to Slideo, is that the thing? Um, and um, please say them like in real life as well. And maybe we can break from me talking to a bit of discussion at different points. Um, so I've got an agenda. Essentially, we're going we're gonna to cover sort of six um, main topics, um, but I'll try and keep my timings down and then make more time, particularly for questions at the end. But feel free to ask questions throughout or chip in with points from yourselves and we'll kind of keep things moving and dynamic. Um, so in case there wasn't enough blurb about me at the start, um, I just wanted to highlight some things. So my background is very charity sector. I had a little stint in agencies when I first left university, but then I went on to be very firmly enmeshed in the charity world and led digital teams at Girl Guiding and at Breast Cancer Care. Um, as part of my work at Breast Cancer Care, I created something called the Voluntary Sector Digital Maturity Matrix, which is now looked after by NCVO. Um, and if you haven't come across it, um, as an aside, it is a really useful tool to help your organisation understand their current digital maturity and set goals and aspirations for the future. Um, so it's still online and available, digitalmaturity.co.uk. Um, you can have a look at that. Um, I'm a trustee as well, so for currently for Turn to Us and Trajectory Theatre, and I've also been a trustee of Sadler's Wells in the past. So I like to look at things from that big, big picture, top level stuff um, and think about building teams and the organisational leadership piece. Um, so we'll bring some of that into what we'll talk about today. Currently a freelance consultant. Um, I'm also a fellow of Interstitia, um, which we, we will mention. It's a little picture of me with the Interstitia fellows, which may become relevant later. Um, and then I'm also a fellow at Newspeak House. Um, and I wanted to highlight Newspeak um, for a couple of reasons, um, mainly because you probably haven't come across it before. Has anyone heard of Newspeak House? Yay, excellent, two people, good. Um, so Newspeak um, is the London College of Political Technologists. Um, it's a residential college. Um, it's not a formal educational body in, that you might think of when you think of the word college, um, but it is a meeting place and a bit of a melting pot for people who are interested in technology, social change, and using tech for good. Um, and it's on Bethnal Green Road, just where Bethnal Green Road me meets Brick Lane. And I definitely encourage you all to check it out. Really interesting place. We have events running most nights of the week on the whole breadth of, of things in the area of um, tech and social good. Um, and every Wednesday night, there's a ration club, um, which means basically 40 to 50 people coming together, sharing food, in those kind of events, I've had a conversation on one side on, you know, it could be like virtual reality and then another side of the room's talking about AI and machine learning and another part of the room's talking about transhumanism. So, you know, crazy stuff like that. If you want to have your mind expanded and meet kind of like-minded people um, who are interested in this stuff, I would definitely um, encourage you to have a look at it. Um, and I was thinking really about, you know, this, this physical building where I spend my life and I do a lot of my work as, as a bit of a paradigm, I suppose, for or an analogy to um, what I'm going to talk about today. So, you know, we at Newspeak, we see a lot of people who come from the startup world 
um, a lot of them with big ideas about how they can create um, social change and add value in the work that they do, either in more of a traditional startup, also thinking about kind of being a social entrepreneur. Um, and then we have people coming from the charity world and um, they are really care about mission driven organisations, care about social impact, um, not always necessarily knowing about the tech stuff. And here these two kind of groups of people meet and they both have things to learn from each other. So today I want to talk about what charities can learn from startups, but also about what startups potentially need to learn from our sector, from the charity world, and then some shared best practices that we can use to inform our work. So um, kind of a best of both worlds, hopefully. Um, so before we get kind of into the content, I thought it would be nice to just have a moment um, to reflect maybe with um, somebody on your road, some person sitting next to you, if you've not met them already, have a little chat for a couple of minutes. Um, what's brought you to this session today? What are your challenges maybe with digital? What's brought you to the conference or what's brought you to this session in particular? And then we'll just take a couple of um, points from the room in terms of your expectations for what you'd like to get out of the session. So have a little chat. Okay, but let's get stuck in. Um, so we've, we've heard of these startup brands. They're known to be great at innovation. At innovation. Um, a lot of them, you know, you might think of Dollar Shave Club and those types of um, me undies and other types of um, companies probably still class them as startups. The likes of Airbnb, would you even think of them as a startup? They've been around, you know, since 2007, I think. Um, Spotify, we've been using as well for over a decade. Um, but the premise really being um, tech companies that have grown out of the startup model and have now had a huge amount of success and have gone on to dominate their markets and, and in fact, create new markets and disrupt existing ways of working and existing business models. Um, what are the secrets of their success? Um, they can scale quickly, um, so they keep costs low um, because they are, um, a lot of them are, majority of them are online or uh, enabled by digital, they're able to do huge things with a really small staff team um, and make the most of everything the internet has to offer and therefore grow really quickly. Um, they're completely aligned to the opportunities and alive to the opportunities of the digital age. So um, unlike more traditional organisations, not necessarily just charities, but also um, other businesses, um, they can jump onto those opportunities. So if you think about the likes of Deliveroo, um, a restaurant is contained by the space that they have. They're on the high street or wherever. They can only operate within that um, restaurant. Deliveroo disrupted that business model. They said, we can, have, we can make use of every single restaurant uh, kitchen across the city um, but they don't actually own any restaurants themselves. Okay? Um, similar with a barber shop, um, they're constrained by the number of customers they can have within a geographical area. Dollar Shave Club can make the most of um, all of the factories anywhere in the world to get razors to people who need them at home, but they've never trimmed a beard themselves. So um, you're actually, you think of these brands as being um, intrinsically linked with the thing that they're doing um, with Deliveroo to restaurants, but Deliveroo doesn't cook any food. So really interesting. Um, I would say, you know, very much open to risk and potential for failure. So I don't know if you're aware, but one in four startups fail, right? So that's a really, really high failure rate. But we, we don't think about that very often. We think about the big success stories, the ones that do well. So that appetite for an opportunity um, is a really interesting thing. Um, they're much more agile than traditional established businesses. So be familiar with the story of Kodak. Kodak went bust in 2012 um, in the same year as uh, Instagram was sold to Facebook for $1 billion. Um, so 
Kodak understood the opportunities for the internet. They had a whole innovation division. They had worked out what they were going to do, but they were a super tanker and they couldn't turn um, quickly enough to actually make the most of those opportunities. Um, and another thing that we know about startups is they are primed for investment. So we've heard the phrase of 10x companies. Um, that's a company that will grow in value 10 times um, within a window. And that is, that's the thing that everyone is really looking for. Um, so they're open to investment, bringing people in and scaling really quickly. So when we think about you know, some of the principles of what makes startups successful, um, it is really that they consider what the market need is they really consider the customer, the consumer, um, and they understand their, uh, essentially that the value of their product. And that would be looking at business need and also audience insight. So we're gonna keep this um, frame around a business need or maybe a financial need um, and an audience need or user need. Um, and we'll come back to this frame. So in the startup world, we have two things, the business imperative and the, the customer imperative, essentially. Um, is anyone familiar with um, Simon Simic's Golden Circle? Yeah. Come across this before? So I think this is a really, um, in terms of understanding the value proposition for a product in the startup world, this is a really useful frame um, and it's very applicable back into the charity world as, as we've seen. Um, so we need to consider three elements. Why we're doing a project or creating a product, what our intended outcome is, and then how we will achieve it. Um, often we start in, in, you know, not just charities again, but in organisations we can start in that outer area. So we think we need to create a fundraising campaign. We need to create an advocacy campaign. We need to design a new service. And we get stuck into the what. How many people is it going to support? What the model is? What we're going to do? Um, instead of thinking initially about the why. So um, in this example, going back to one of our favorite tech companies, Apple, um, we can see like, the why and uh, the importance of that. So in Apple's golden circle, the why is, with everything we do, we aim to challenge the status quo, we aim to think differently. The how is, we make user-friendly, beautifully designed and easy to use products. And the what is, we make computers. So often if, if we start with thinking you know, about that advocacy campaign or about that fundraising campaign, essentially we are starting with the computers. And that's great. But then you're kind of thinking back to the 80s and 90s, you're every PC company that was operating back then and Apple's differentiating factor, the real value that they could be seen to bring to the market was that they considered the why and they had their brand values at the heart of everything they do. And you can really see that across these um, tech enabled startups that they consider the why. Okay, so we've, we've got a why, um, and we, I mentioned their brand values, but that's a really interesting thing, isn't it, in terms of values when you're thinking about startups versus charities, because aren't we the ones with the values? Um, so we saw in the previous slide with our circles, we had the business area and the audience area um, and here with um, social entrepreneurship or charities we introduce a third area of social value so we've got users finances and social value and and this concept was introduced by nominate trust which has now become social tech trust um, and it's also um, spoken about a lot by cast a really great organization these three strands of value and that's where we can you know, presents a real challenge, actually. Um, I was speaking to somebody last week um, who really shifted my thinking on this. He's saying, it's really easy to go into work every day and just think about selling stuff. 
But if you've got to think about driving value for your organization in terms of financial value, you've also got to think about the user's experience and how they are interfacing with your products or your services. And then you've also got to create a change in the world through that. So you've got to create this social impact or social value. That's actually a lot more difficult than just selling crisps or you know, getting people to use your rideshare service or what, whatever that is. So um, we have additional complexity um, and in dealing with this additional complexity, we can actually, um, you know, in, in a way it's more interesting, it's definitely more challenging. Um, and then we also have the challenge of values. And I think this is something that we can definitely teach a role model. We can influence um, in society in terms of how charities and non-profit organisations work. Um, I don't know how familiar you are, again, with these stories of people leaving tech companies because of clashes in values. Um, but certainly a lot of burnout in tech companies and in startups, um, walkouts at Google. Um, and then we see, you know, in Google's design principles, they talk about mission and they're very, very clear that mission is a key part of what they do and how they design. And their mission is to organise the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, which is a wonderful mission um, and much bigger than just search for something uh, online, just find that information that you need. Um, really, really great. But at the same time, they're removing the don't be evil um, part from their code of conduct, um, which is probably testament to how they are and how they act as an organisation. So not as much as they might talk about mission and they might talk about values, they are far from being a values-led organisation and are, in my opinion, a little bit evil. Um, I, I thought it'd be nice to look at a couple of really good mission statements. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Unlimited, they support social entrepreneurs to help them transform the world for good. Um, and they have a great brand playbook that goes through all of their vision, mission, values and, and who they are as an organisation. And their mission is to find social entrepreneurs with bold solutions to today's challenges. Through funding and support, we help them realise their potential and create lasting change. Um, so in terms of sort of tech-enabled um, charities and, and not-for-profits online, this is a really interesting one to look at. And then WeFarm, um, is, uh, is anyone here familiar with WeFarm? Yeah, a really great example of um, not a charity, actually, a, a for-profit company, um, but one that has really um, important values and is, is definitely for good. Um, so they help through using SMS, so really simple technology, they, create far uh, they connect farmers from all over the world in peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, so that, say, one farmer has a problem with his goats in Kenya, he can send an SMS and get support from uh, another farmer who maybe in a t totally different part of the world, could be Sri Lanka, where they also have goats, and then those guys can have a chat and help solve each other's problems. Um, so they don't have maybe as clearly defined a mission, but um, they talk about how information improves livelihoods, they connect millions of people, um, and they understand that peer-to-peer -peer is a powerful model. So looking at how those values are embedded within the organisation. So let's think about how we can find the best of both worlds. We've got three principles that we're going to talk through um, with a couple of examples in there uh, to see how we can bring the worlds of startups, the worlds of charities together and, and kind of find a good way to use digital um, in that mix. Okay, um, so in both of the models, the, the two circles of the startup or business model and the three circles around the charity or social innovation model, um, we need to understand our audience. Um, so in order to understand audience, um, in, with my more charity hat on, um, I talk a lot about co-creation. Um, so that's not about just getting people's opinions, 
getting facts, but actually working with audiences, um, with users to really understand their needs and do that in a, in a meaningful and profound way. And user research um, and experience considerations are very much part and parcel of the digital world. We can see them being used really effectively in startups, um, really effectively across digital agencies now. These disciplines are quite established. So we'd see a lot of user interviews, shadowing people in different contexts, um, doing workshops, bringing people together, lots of user testing. So these are all things um, that either you can do internally with your internal team or you can bring in outside expertise to do them. Um, the key thing here is, you know, I've talked a lot about over the years about, you know, empowering our audiences and giving them a voice. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a quote that I heard recently from um, the CEO of Migrants Organize, um, Zin Cabrillo, and she said, when I say that I'm empowering you, in that moment, I'm taking power away from you. Um, so if we're really looking at being truly co-creative, we need to understand the terms of that, that relationship and the way that we're working with people, um, be they beneficiaries of, of the organisation or um, people who are supporting the organisation and kind of understand that contract and that relationship. Um, down with focus groups. Um, so it's a, a very common way of um, getting audience insight, but um, can be really unhelpful actually, because often people, one person in that focus group will have a very strong voice and that will kind of block out other people. Um, and instead, you know, I'd really advocate for doing depth interviews. Um, often it's enough to do five interviews with people if you're looking at one kind of segment of your audience or a product for one group um, that should be able to unearth uh, enough insights for you to move forward um, we we want to talk about what what people are doing in their daily lives um, what where they might experience the type of products that you're looking to create um, what problems they are having as well, what their problems are, what their barriers are, what their pain points are. Um, and in terms of solutions, not asking them what they want. Um, yeah, the, the example there is kind of the Homer Simpsons car. You know, if you, if anyone, that's a really early Simpsons reference, actually. I'm not sure if you get it, but um, they, they at one point asked Homer Simpson to design a car and he had like a DeLorean with a bubble top roof and a giant cup holder. And that's kind of what you get if you ask people um, to design. That's not somebody's job unless they're actually a product designer to design the solution. That's your job. Um, so maybe asking them what an ideal world would look like or what would make their life better is a different way to find that out. And then um, these are things that you can delve into more deeply when the slides are shared, but tips for how to interview well and actually how to, how to conduct depth interviews, which you might find really useful. Allow plenty of time. Sometimes people like to talk, it's good. Um, and then again, an, another resource that you can use. Um, so coming out of these interviews, you'll understand what people do, um, what people say, how people feel, um, what they think, and you can start to record these. Um, and in the past, I've created personas, and I still think personas can be really helpful, um, but I've also started to use empathy maps, and um, IDEO has some great resources, um, so this is available. Um, you can download it from their website. It will be in the slides as well. Um, and a bit of a case study for this, so from my time at Girl Guiding, our vision was to involve girls and volunteers in our strategy to enable volunteers to do what they needed to do online, kind of some quite um, ta tangible operational things they needed to do, and then to champion um, the girls and, and um, give them a or amplify their voice, not give them a voice, amplify their voice. Um, so co-creation, really in-depth user research was a huge part of what we did at Girl Guiding and what the organisation continues to do to this day. Um, and if you are interested in a really um, big user research challenge, then try and do um, 
practical user research with rainbows who are like five to seven years old, spend a lot of time crawling around on the floor. Um, but that was a, yeah really interesting to find out how they use different online tools, um, bit of talk to parents as well about what, what they felt was appropriate and amounts of screen time and things like that, but really trying to bring out those um, user needs from girls and young women. Oh, there we go. Um, was really cool um, and yeah, lots of really interesting insights from that that shaped our work. Um, so on to the next thing, number two. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions about the piece around audiences and co-creation before we do that? Can get it, add it to Slideo. We'll get it at the end. There we are. Um, okay, so um, why do we need to think iteratively um, and why is it so important to get really get to grips with using our data? Well, we see that the life cycles of product creation, but also campaign creation are speeding up and we can't always control them. So it would have been in the past if, if as a charity we were creating a behaviour change campaign, we would have time to plan it out and really control that life cycle. Now the Me Too movement sparks up, there's no organisation behind that, there's an opportunity maybe to jump on and become part of that or to sit that out because you're not able to be that responsive. So very much um, a, a very quick life cycle um, and the same is true on the product development side. So that's why um, we look at what has happened in the startup world and the book Lean Startup is a great example of this. Um, building minimum viable products is a great way to be able to move more quickly. Um, so an MVP is the simplest version of a solution that you can build as quickly and cheaply as possible so that you can get to market, you can actually get to your users quickly and start providing them value. Um, you're not prioritizing the needs of internal stakeholders, you're prioritizing the needs of the users. Um, you can get great um, data much, much more quickly and then make improvements based on that. Um, and then eventually you can start building out, adding features, improving the design to make things look even better and work even better than they already do. So we talk about this um, loop, starting with learning, as we just covered, learning about your audiences, learning about your, their needs, then building something, um, measuring, getting it out to the market, getting it in front of users, measuring how they're using it, getting data, and then learning from that, um, and then building again. So that's nice and simple, going around in a circle. Um, the, the other kind of counter to that is you want to keep it as lean and as minimal as possible, but think about what makes it lovable as well, because sometimes something can be so basic that there's kind of no joy in it for a user. Um, so you want your supporters or service users to have enough there that makes them want to return to it and makes them enjoy using it as well. Um, and test and learn is so important. So in order to do that, um, here are some tools. So we, we kind of mentioned um, tools and um, the technical side. So here are some that really helps in the testing process. In terms of tools that help on the front end, so things that actually users would interact with, then that's where your user research is gonna come in really handy to find out where people are spending time online and what tools would actually be appropriate for them. Cool, and then we mentioned funding. So um, this stuff costs money, um, it's not free. And there are routes to go around, you know, finding in-kind support um, and so on, but really um, a bit of investment will help you um, move forward. So um, Big Lottery has a new um, digital transformation fund. Um, Comic Relief's latest round of Tech for Good funding is still open, I think until the 23rd of March. Um, 
if you're a bit earlier stage and you're just starting to think in this way, CAST have a round of design hops, um, which you can sign up to for free. And they have a lot of recommendations about how to get funding. And I'm co-delivering those design hops and they're good fun. Um, more and more trusts and foundations are getting digitally savvy and are interested and positive about applications that include something digital or are about digital change. Um, and then you could also think about crowdfunding as part of the mix as well if there's a specific product. Um, so the case study here to kind of illustrate this test and learn iterative approach um, is from breast cancer care and my former colleague Christina is actually here. Christina is the, used to be the um, digital innovation manager of breast cancer care and actually was responsible for a lot of making this really, really great. Even though I was um, the sort of heading up the team, it was really just her amazing work. Do you want to say anything about this? No, you're like, no. We had a little confab before and she's like, yeah, okay, Joe, I could say something. She's like, no, I'm not. Um, I'm, in, I'm in the flow. I won't go on too long either. So um, the app that was created um, at Breast Cancer Care is called Becca. Um, it's an app for women moving forward after breast cancer. Um, when we started the project, we did not know that we were going to build an app. Um, we were very focused on collating and understanding the user needs, bringing in a really amazing group of women who worked with us to understand what those needs were. Then we were very careful to iterate, partly because at the beginning of the project we had no money. Um, we started with a very small chunk of investment. So we built a really, it looked really nice, but it, it wasn't actually technically very sophisticated. We built a web app and did a lot of testing before we iterated and then ultimately had a native phone app that we launched and started um, getting users for. And then after I left, so this is definitely not down to me, we went from this project that started with 10K of very initial seed funding and went on to get nearly 700K of funding for Big Lottery, uh, from Big Lottery to continue the project and to scale it up. So I think it's a really nice example of what's possible. Um, and this is for you know, 70,000 women a year um, experience breast cancer and have to deal with moving forward after breast cancer. The face-to-face -face services of the charity were only ever helping 3,000 people a year and now there's this amazing app that can help you know actually bridge that gap and help lots of people. So a really nice case study I think in terms of the power of tech for good and certainly using a lot of principles from the startup world as well. Um, so barriers to innovation. So this comes very much from a private sector point of view. Harvard Bus Business Review um, did a big piece of research um, and found out the kind of top obstacles to innovation in large companies. Um, and so the, the first one is politics. The second one is cultural issues. Um, and then there's issues around recruitment, not enough um, skills lack of CEO support, um, it's, it, there's a lot of people issues here. So if we think that it's about the technology, um, it's not. Often it's about, it's about people, it's about how people are led, about how um, people are skilled up um, and prepared to respond to this changing environment of the digital age. Um, I think if it was about the tech, we would probably have figured it out by now. Um, might have been tough in the beginning, but we've had like 10, 15, 20 plus years of adaption. Um, so we might have got it. Um, so absolutely, your team will need to be supported to work differently, um, learn digital skills and adopt a new culture to adapt really to the digital age. So we talk a lot about digital culture within organisations. Um, and in, in order to enable this, you know, I like to think um, very much based in values driven leadership in terms of our personal values. So we talked at the beginning about the values of um, not for profit organisations, the mission um, that's really important there. 
think about an in leadership personal values and how they align with organizational values. Um, when I mentioned interstitia um, at the beginning, this is a lot of work that that foundation does in terms of um, supporting future leaders as well. <coughs> So we've kind of been reflecting a lot on this and doing some work on this. And I think that there are three key values of digital leaders. And it so turns out that they all begin with C. Um, curiosity, engaged with the questions of our age, looking for answers in unusual places, always in learning mode. I was reading a, about a startup the other day which helps um, people working in other startups to read literature and see plays. And apparently that's a job now. Um, but, but I think in terms of curiosity, getting, looking and getting the answers in different places, being curious about all aspects of the world we live in is very important. Um, the second, courage. Unafraid of challenge, open to opportunities, accepting of risks, steadfast in hard times. So, you know, we may not, it may not be in our gift to be as positive about risk as people who work in startups, but we can certainly have that mindset and reframe risks as opportunities. Um, think about, you know, what is this really the worst that can happen? How can we move past it and see what's to be gained? And then the third, creativity, finds innovative solutions to problems, borrows from other sectors, brings together people with varied skills. So we don't, we don't mean by creativity that I can paint you a wonderful picture, but it's about how can we bring in people with different skill sets, some of whom will be creative in that way, um, but actually looking at what works across different places, we can be, there's many, many ways to be creative. Um, and again, from interstitia, bringing this together, thinking about the idea of analog leadership in a digital world. So being a digital leader is not about um, using a particular app to help manage your workforce. Um, it is about being, you know, these three values um, and adapting to the digital world. Um, through things like leading multidisciplinary teams where people may not have the skills that you have um, and also being comfortable not having all the answers all of the time because it's so fast paced you have to trust the people who really know their areas and be comfortable not always knowing. There's a great example here um, from Dot Everyone about digital culture um, so there's a, a link in the slides, you can go on and read the full post. Um, my favourite bit to pull out is the quote, which is really old from Peter Drucker, um, who's a management theorist who talks, he says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, so we really need to get the culture right and that digital culture before we can build towards digital change. Um, and then you're not a leader if no one's following you, which <laughs> I'm just going to keep reminding myself. Um, but these are some more practical hints and tips um, around culture and working practices that, um, again, will be in the slides. You can delve into those. Um, be clear about expectations. Always a good one. Yes. Oh, and some people may not stay on the journey, and that's OK. And there are a lot of people mentioning that their organizations were on a journey at the moment. So, you know, you do want people to be following you. But if some of them drop off, you know, that might be quite natural and there might be a better fit for them somewhere else. Um, I'm happy to, to stick around and have chats and answer any other questions. Um, but thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you.